All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. So thanks for your patience. I did want to make sure everyone had time to get on. Uh, everyone, welcome to Social Media Community Translation Models, an NCSoft case study hosted by Lionbridge Game Services. Before we get started, I did want to get some housekeeping out of the way. I want to let everyone know uh, at any point, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask, you can simply type those questions into the question box and we will get to them as soon as we can. We're going to have a more extensive Q&A towards the end of the presentation, but still please feel free to type anything in as you come along, as, as we go along so that you don't forget them. Uh, and also we're definitely going to try to answer them as we go along as well. So first off, really thank you everyone for showing up. I uh, really hope you're going to get a lot out of this session. Uh, I want to give you a rundown of how we're going to be proceeding today. So first of all, I'm going to be presenting my bio and Omid will be presenting himself. That's Omid Dariani of NCSoft who's partnering with us on this webinar. Then I'm going to give you just a general overview of Lionbridge Game Services. Then we're going to get into the pain. So what kind of challenges exactly we're addressing with this model our solution, how we are going to meet and conquer these challenges, and then the benefits of how this model works. And then lastly, we're going to show some specific examples from the NCSoft program itself so you can really see how this works in practice. And then after we conclude the main portion of the webinar, we're going to try to leave, like I said, around five to ten minutes to take care of uh, any of the questions that came up as we went along that we were not able to get to. So here's what you're going to get out of this. We put together this presentation on this specific challenge that many of us who work in community face. And what you're going to learn today here are some ways in which you can structure and staff your team, including technology necessary to support it, so that you can serve all of your community with that same depth and agility that you do for your English community. And, and actually even how this kind of model can even improve your English coverage. We've had a lot of success helping our game services clients using this model, and one of our standout success stories is NCSoft, and NCSoft, NCSoft is the case study that we're going to use today to, as an example to focus on. So here we go. First, a little bit about myself. My name's Chloe Swain, and I've been with Lionbridge Game Services for just about three years now. I've been working in entertainment going on 15 years, and prior to Lionbridge, I worked at Screen Life Games as a games producer and a localization project manager. After that, I was at Lego, where I started specializing in community, and specifically international community. And then since working at Lionbridge, I've continued that focus, and I now oversee our social media and community strategy services through Lionbridge Game Services. My co-presenter is Omi Dariani. So, Omi, if you would go ahead and introduce yourself. Hello. Uh, as Chloe said, my name is Omi Dariani. I'm the director of community and social at NCSoft. Uh, so that means that we run sort of all external communications, with the exception of public relations. So anything except talking to the press runs through my team. That means forums, moderation, that sort of thing. Uh, my background, I've been at Sony, I've been at Hasbro, I've been, um, I've worked on Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh and all kinds of cool stuff, um, do a lot of stuff with Twitch and generally manage a pretty strong team, it's about 15 people here uh, for NCSoft's global community. Awesome, thanks Omid. So here, just an overview of Lionbridge Game Services. Lionbridge Game Services is a division of Lionbridge, and it was really a natural evolution of our core offerings. Lionbridge, as a company, has been testing and localizing games for decades, but about four years ago, this new group was formed, and, and what it did is just draw on the strength of this existing legacy within Lionbridge as a games industry partner, and then added strategic players who are working in the games industry to build out our muscle and infrastructure in this space. And we now have a solid structure, around the clock talent working all over the world. We've got leadership centralized into game production centers across Europe, North America, and Asia. And we work with top publishers and platform, platform holders deliver AAA game titles on multiple platforms and help our clients expand into new markets. 
and effectively engage with their game users worldwide, which is really this engagement of players part is, is what we're focusing on here today. So first off, we really want to show you what this is really all about and, and by starting off with a concrete example of what we're talking about. And this is the kind of situation we're trying to avoid with this model. And Omid, would you like to talk a little bit about what we're seeing here? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, one of, the, one of the things that we see a lot is, you know, we have, we have a global game. You know, our game is in multiple languages. And so obviously with games, you have gamers who are very passionate people, and they often get very upset about changes to the game, service interruptions, things like that. Uh, and when you have the situation that, you know, a lot of it comes in a language that your team doesn't primarily speak, uh, it can also come at off times and weird situations, so uh, it's really important to be able to get to the information quickly and resolve it quickly. And this is where we're, where we're headed and what we're showing in this model, and um, this is how you can essentially take a team of people, integrated community and translation, and have them quickly and with minimal back and forth create communication with your team, with, with your community, um, with little churn, little bit of back and forth, and, and just minimize the kind of hassle that can sometimes come into this kind of structure and just make things as easy and well and free flowing as possible. So now to get into our pain points. So time zone coverage, you know, how do you cover the engagement needs of your community around the clock? There are of course some automated systems that can help mitigate some of the daily perils of online community, spam bot detectors, auto replies, etc. But a healthy portion of the most important engagement in community requires a depth of knowledge, language expertise, and gamer expertise, and it really needs to be carried out by real live people. And you, as a company, as a product, you've made a commitment to serve your community, and that means your entire community. So as your community hopefully continues to grow and include more and more people for whom English isn't their first language, this need for quick turnaround translation comes up more and more often. And as companies grow and become more successful, products and services are released into new territories and official, official community channels are founded. Now, of course, unofficial communities pop up all the time around your product, but I'm talking about when you've made this decision, uh, as NCSoft has, to start a Facebook page, a Twitter account, et cetera, officially for your product in various languages. Now the expectation is going to remain the same for the user as it always should be, which is that they expect they and they deserve this individually, your thoughtful attention, your quick attention. But as those individual community members start to spread further and further around the globe, the harder it becomes to handle this necessary communication that's required to meet those expectations. And I know Omid and I have talked about this, um, and Omid, if you wouldn't mind speaking to some of your experience as far as the, the community expectations when it comes to those new territories. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the things where at the outset of your product, you know, at the outset of your company even, you have to decide what your promise is to not, you know, non-English speaking territories. And the expectation generally, <laughs> at least for the bigger companies, is that you're doing real-time simultaneous uh, shipping of products, uh, communications, that sort of thing. So the expectation is that if you're announcing something in English, you're also announcing it in French, German, Spanish, Italian, whatever languages you're covering. And those audiences, even though there's a lot of overlap with uh, English, they feel slighted and they, they start to feel like second-class citizens if you're not holding up that end of the bargain. So we really try to make sure that everything has time built in for localization and that sort of thing, but as you know, in any in any industry and especially in online live games, uh, stuff breaks all the time. Unexpected problems come up, and you generally have to respond to things in less than 24 hours. 
Absolutely, and that is really uh, what this is about here. I mean, we're all familiar with this kind of pain that uh, Omin is describing here, and the needs, and they come in many forms. There are, there are press releases that have been put together by your marketing department, finished just in the nick of time, but of course, just in the nick of time for English. So when the community team gets the press release passed to them, this mad scramble can begin to get it translated for these foreign language markets you've committed to serving. And then also, as Omid was saying, you know, as website and server traffic increases, things get overloaded. And a quick response to downtime and errors is absolutely essential to keep your community happy and not to mention to keep your retention numbers high. And then depending on your industry, there can be live events associated with your product. And as your community ex expands, so for example, in games, eSports, you know, as the, the location of this event, these events are going to be all over the world and appropriate live social coverage requires people to first of all to actually be awake <laughs> as well as that be they be fluent in both English and the local language of the event. In English they need to report back to you and then in the local language because they need to be interacting with the people real time. And then another unfortunate reality is that natural and man-made tragedies occur at a frequent enough rate that not having people on hand to react in a timely and appropriate manner can be perceived at best as insensitive and then at worst that kind of delayed reaction can come across even in worst case as intentional and then of course extremely offensive so strategic time zone coverage really becomes a major factor in keeping your community healthy happy and safe so another pain point is that on-call translation is cost prohibitive and, you know, for those of us who work in localization, we love it. And I did want to relay this anecdote. I was recently found myself in a room full of colleagues, none of whom who speak English as a first language. And there was this earnest discussion that took place about the word abridged in English and what it means. And then comparisons to words with similar etymologies and other languages spoken around the room came up. And it really hit me, you know, we are just, this is a company of language nerds and we love it. And not everybody feels that way and that's fine. That's why we have to service for others. Um, because for many of you, localization and translation, it isn't your primary focus. It, it, because it is ours at Lionbridge Game Services, we know there are several tiers of quality when it comes to localization. We really, and we work in that. And the, and the kind of process and quality checks that come into play for the localization of an audio script, for example, is not the same as what's needed for a press release or a Facebook post. And with localization, what you're often, pay, often paying for is not just the work itself, but a guaranteed turnaround time. And on-call on translation services can be quite expensive. Now, the needs of community when it comes to translations are really all about time. And budgets for community teams, which are focus primarily on English don't often have a lot of wiggle room for adding a full team of on-call translators so what can end up happening is that the standard localization pipeline get you gets used to do translation work and this requires going outside of your community team and it adds time so you communicate the German community that the server is down but by the time you have that text translated it's already up again or or you get the press release to French game publications, by the time they get it, they've already heard the day before in English, and they put together their own botched version of that, which misses your main points, and, and they are not going to write another article. Yet paying for on-call translation really just isn't an option. And the third point here is, um, and in particular, when the translation request is originating from the community team itself, it's that no matter how skilled the translator is, no matter how steep they are in games in general, there, there is an unavoidable back and forth communication that takes place on even the smallest of translations. For good translators, they really want to get it right. So typically, when translations are routed through standard localization process, the team that's doing the translation is outside of the community structure. And they may even be, be based in one different time zone. And so a, a single question can equal several more hours of wait until the clarification is made. So when you're dealing with social and community forum posts, those hours make your content go from relevant to obnoxiously old. And this is something Omid and I have talked about. I don't know, um, you know, based on what you've experienced, Omid, do you have anything to add to that as far as how that can affect your team? Yeah, I mean, just just the fact that 
you know, and I think in games it's really difficult because it has a lot of a technical writing aspect to it. You know, not only do you have to communicate effectively, uh, which is something that uh, you know, obviously any localization person can do, but it has a lot in common with, you know, technical documentation or legal documentation. You have to know specific words, and specific words have to be translated, you know, correctly every time. You know, for example, you know, if you call your character a, a hero in the game, hero could be translated, you know, five different ways in Italian, but you, you need the localization people to always be doing the, the one that's in the game, right? And so there's a level of, you know, retention of terms, of the culture, of the dialogue that's really important because the audience is very cynical and if they feel like you're missing anything or, you know, you don't have it quite right, they start to feel like, you know, you're some outside crappy service. You have to be very careful with that. Exactly. And that's really, I mean, we're going to get into that more later, but that's how um, this kind of team, you know, you have the people who are working on the team who are so steeped in that community culture um, that it really helps to alleviate a lot of that pain. So thanks, Omid. Um, so now moving on to our solution that we're talking about today, this kind of model, this moderator translator team. The entire moderator translator model is founded on this assumption that teams they change and grow, team, mem team members come and go. But any knowledge that's gained by your team should always be collected and always be accessible at all times to everybody on the team. And any work that's performed by a moderator should benefit the entire team. Very importantly for ongoing efficiency, anytime a new member joins the team, they should have the benefit of all the prior work that's been done. And by using tools which show communication history, ensure version control, and they build and organize translation memories for your localization, you're going to be setting yourself up to achieve this. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the concept of a translation memory, I just wanted to uh, talk about that right now. Um, what it is is there is a database that stores segments, which can be sentences, paragraphs, units of sentences like headings or titles, and these are all segments that have been translated already. So in order to achieve efficiency in a team that's doing translation, if you have all those being stored up, it means things don't need to be retranslated and it keeps consistency. And you know, this is an agile mo model, so with communication it has to be really swift and clear, which is why we use a tool, uh, we use Slack in this case, but we can use other tools similar, which really that's something that is helps to keep communication going on within the team because when you've got a team of 10 plus moderators, three community managers, one or two coordinators, it's really impossible to work within the construct of email communication alone. Then we also use a moderation dashboard tools such as Hootsuite. They're also essential so when individual team members are managing multiple channels, multiple social channels, which have multiple logins and then ever-changing security features um, such as Facebook and Twitter, famous for that, always changing that. Having a single login dashboard to perform your duties is really necessary. And then also using a computer-aided translation tool, which is also known as a CAT tool, uh, not to mention staffing your team with people acquainted with how to optimize the use of that tool. It's, it's going to help to ensure that ongoing translation consistency across team members. So you'll see here in this model, the team is scheduled to work specific shifts. And of course, 24-7 coverage of all your social channels is ideal. However, as we're all well aware, budgets don't always allow for this. So you have to make decisions, as we did with the NCSoft team, about which hours are to be prioritized based on channel traffic, top markets, and then shifts are scheduled with that in mind. So the very nature of this flexible team that's spread across time zone really lends itself to this global home-based workforce. So when a moderator translator shows up for duty, um, as you'll see here, the showing up is done online in this chosen communication tool, of course, in this case, Slack. And at that time, the mod has instant messaging conversations with other people on the team in order to find out the current state of the community. And then they read the shift report from the previous moderator log in to all the appropriate tools and get to work. And, you know, it, it can happen that a complete shift goes by where there's no translation request at all. But if one does, the moderation duties are dropped 
and priorities shifted to completing and publishing that translation. Once it's done, they get back to their duties and uh, check out at the end of their shift, pass along their information to the next moderator. And, and a major challenge for any team working in an Agile environment is that these little bits of information, they can get lost or they sometimes reside solely in one person's head and they can't be spread, they, they, therefore they're not spread out amongst the entire team. And so a, a key component of the successful moderator translator team is integrating the use of a CAT tool, such as Lionbridge's translation workspace, to execute the translation work. And terminology glossaries are passed along to community teams from localization teams, but version control and file storage quickly can become an issue. So having the moderator translator team use a cloud-based CAT tool to perform the work has several advantages. First, this aforementioned organization and storage of known glossaries, it's absolutely key. And I think the visual on the left for anybody who's worked in this field is, uh, uh, you can feel it, that you have all these Excel spreadsheets coming at you and you really um, don't have a way, a, a nice way of keeping track of them. And you know, tracking down this jumble of Excel spreadsheets containing those terms can really be a bear. And with this, you have a repository for all this. And here you can also see how the knowledge transfer and this team-wide efficiency comes into play. So, you know, any new glossary terms are input into the tool and gone is this era of an email coming in, you know, make sure to translate this term a certain way going for, forward and, and leaving that up to the team to keep track of that for themselves. Or, you know, can you coordinator put this new term into version 500 of the spreadsheet and let the team know? This is all taken care of through the CAT tool. And then through use of the CAT tool ongoing, all these translation memories, they continue to grow. And again, those are those bits of information that are already translated, already translated texts. And many of the translations that moderators perform will be ones that have already gone out previously or very similar versions have. So full sentences and portions of sentences have already been translated. So when, when you integrate this kind of CAT tool into your model, your current team, there are several advantages. Current, your current team is going to be using consistent terms and styles across, across translations. And then, of course, new team members are going to benefit from that as well because when they join the team, all that translation memory is already going to be built up. So here you can see a visual example of the typical process for the community translation as it's carried out by this team. At 8.52 a.m., a request comes in, the German and the French moderator check in. The, you know, they're stopping their tasks as moderators. They're prioritizing now this new translation. They have a couple of clarifications back and forth via the Slack tool with the community manager who's on duty. And again, because they're so very well versed in this game, they are familiar with terms that might be an issue, um, and so they have really specific targeted questions and are able to get to those questions very quickly. And then 9.46 a.m., we've got our finished product that's going to be published out on the community channels. Another wonderful added benefit is that the folks, especially when this happens in the middle of a shift, they're the ones, they're putting out this translation, they're putting up the communication to the community, and then they're also the people who, when the community reacts to it, they are interacting and engaging with the, those community members. So as a translator, it's a really nice full circle kind of um, environment to work in. And I have heard from translators that work on this team who, who've done straight translation before for games that this kind of environment is really uh, satisfying and helps them also become better translators because they're not working in a vacuum, they're actually seeing the reaction to the work that they do. Did you have anything else to add there, Omid, before I move on? I think, yeah, I think that your last point there is really important. Uh, one of the pieces that's really interesting about this model and kind of frustrating about localization sometimes, you know, we'll get a localization back from you know, a random company when we're doing tests and it's like, oh, you just 
it's it's not that they're bad. They just don't understand the game. They don't understand the culture. They don't understand who they're talking to. But you know, the fact that I mean, I was using Slack as the primary communication method for my team before we even integrated the moderation team, uh, just because it's super efficient and lets us kind of communicate, you know, the serious stuff as well as fun stuff. And you know, so it's nice to have them there. They feel like they're actually part of the team instead of you know this distant service that you know just hey hey work you know like we play Clash Royale with a couple of them. Um, it's just you know they actually feel like they're part of the team, and I think because of that, number one, they're more motivated to do a good job. Number two, they're more capable of doing a good job since they know you know they know what we're talking about and they have instant access to ask somebody a question. Um, I think it's really been one of the strongest uh, values that we've gotten out of it. Awesome. That's really good to hear. And I just, from our side, I have to say that it's definitely a super fun company to work with. And CSoft, everybody is really happy to be working on this project. Also, you know, for that, for that, not only for what you just said, but really just because there is that kind of interaction. It's, it's a fun environment. And everybody is just really about very helpful also. So, and that helps with that, using that kind of tool like Slack definitely helps. So now moving on to the benefits. So, you know, we've touched on a lot of these before, but, you know, with on-brand community focused translation is really something that you get out of this. There are many ways to communicate an idea. And at Lionbridge, of course, that's the medium we work in, words and language. With community messaging, it's especially important that you connect with your customers and that the message you're sending out shows you are, as Omid was referring to before, with them, really part of this crew. By using a moderator translator model, you're ensuring that the folks writing the translation for their regional communities have the tools at hand and quite simply the time in the trenches interacting and engaging with individual players that they're able to write something that really connects with the player spot on. So what you're seeing here, you know, is something on the left. It's written very much in the tone of this game in English. It's it's referring to a player up at the top, Caret, who is a very good player and um, someone known in the community. And then the tra then the the text itself is really in the style of the game. On the right, what you're seeing is that same idea and that same feeling in French. Now, and that is down to the player. You'll see it's a different player. That is a player who in the French community is very famous and known for being very helpful and interactive. So it really becomes uh, a very true to the community kind of translation that is just a, a step above what you can do if you don't have people actually working in the trenches as, uh, as members of the community team. Because moderator translators, you know, they know what player dominated yesterday, they moderate the forums, and they read the posts about what's happening actually in the game. And they can reference images, they could reference videos that have been posted on social, they, because they're engaging in that space uh, as their in their capacity as moderators. And it really does take translation to another level and, and brings a translator as close to the product and builds in context for translators systematically as part of the day-to-day -day workflow. And what you're seeing there is, is an example of that. And then again, the great thing is this full circle. Not only are they completing the translation, but they're also the ones who are moderating the responses to the text they wrote. So it's, just, it's, it's really a rare and extremely valuable connection for a translator that to have to his or her own work. And next, uh, another benefit is this cost-effective tier two translation. So with community translation, the quality bar does not require multiple QA checks, touches by several people. Tier 2 level translation, like social posts, FAQs, crisis response, they, they just don't require that level of quality. What it needs to do is it needs to connect with the players, and that's the main thing. And really, with this combination of context and, and connection, it, it gives you a it gives you the appropriate rate for this kind of translation. So, because with something that's like an audio script or uh, you know, story and lore that's going to be in game, that definitely does need to be checked at at another level, at a standard level of, of translation. But it's just not the case when it comes to community translation. 
And the third benefit, uh, which really I feel is the, the, the crux of it, like the main thing about this model, which really makes it work, is that with this moderator translator model, you've got a work face, a workforce that's performing triple duty anytime you're paying for their service. And by doing that, you're reducing your cost by two thirds because otherwise you'd be paying for English coverage. You'd be paying additionally for that same time for an additional language. Plus you'd be paying for on-call hours during that same period of time. So you, you'd be paying for three separate services. And in this way, we're really efficiently able to put it into one person. In this case, you, you don't have to send out a heads up to a team of translators that a translation might be coming up because they're already around and on shift working the forums. And they're expecting that at any moment a translation request might be coming around. And then meanwhile, they're covering all of your English channels and all the channels in their specialty language. So essentially what you end up with is this on-call team where you aren't paying specifically for on-call status. So now I'm gonna hand over to Omi to go through um, some examples that he has where in practice uh, this really works out and, and is a benefit to him and his team. Thanks, Louie, yeah. Um, I mean, I think the, the, the benefits go across a huge range of things and it's really the sort of unexpected situations where <laughs> you get the most out of it. Uh, the first one I call the three alarm fire, right? And this is this is when everything has gone just as badly as it can. You know, of course, it's the middle of the night, something like that. Everyone's asleep because we've uh, you know had a long day of patching the client or putting out an update, uh, and then some. Suddenly, something breaks. Right? You know, we've gone through our monitoring periods, we've done everything we're supposed to, but it just breaks, or someone's found an exploit. You wake up in the morning, and all the top five posts on Reddit are all about how your company sucks and you know, how everyone's going to quit the game and things like that. Uh, and what do you do? And you have to get to the point where you can very quickly issue an official statement, again, in multiple languages because you've made that promise to your community. It's actually funny how you can have a massive problem and put out a statement very quickly in English and you still have you know, half the people pissed off at you because it's like, oh, I see how it is, you know, NCSoft only cares about the English speaking audience or something. So you have to be careful and quick with what you're doing. Um, and you need that process to happen, you know, in 90 to 120 minutes. Uh, as Chloe was saying with the, you know, it doesn't benefit us to have on-call localization because 95, 99% of the content we do can go through a normal localization pipeline, but when we have these emergencies, that pipeline is just way too slow. So, you know, our ability to just throw up a flag and say, hey, who's who's online, who's on shift, who can, who can loop this message, you know, they already know what the problem is because they've been seeing it on the forums for hours. Uh, so, you know, they, they can tell, they can help massage the message and make sure the message is right. Uh, because they really understand the nuance of what you're trying to do. Um, so again, that's that's really just you identify a problem very quickly, you know, put the message together, have the moderators available to localize it, and you know, you can turn something around in an hour or two that would, through our normal process, take a minimum of a day. And that's if I'm twisting people's arms. <laughs> so the next one. Um, the next one is I call the one alarm alarm, <laughs> and it's not, you know, because again, the, the value of this comes across uh, a spectrum of different things, and this is one that we get this a lot you, in gaming, especially gamers are really smart at figuring out systems. They're very smart at figuring out when you have a lot of coverage, when you don't, uh, what the line is where people get warnings or they get in trouble, that sort of thing. And the people that are good at it can actually cause a lot of problems and cause a lot of negativity in your space um, without raising a, a big alarm. So having the moderators in, you know, in all languages who really understand what we're trying to do and who the community is, I think the example that Chloe used earlier 
of switching from a prominent English speaking player to a prominent French speaking player um, is a really good example. The moderators get to the point where they know the names of the posters on the forum. They can actually, you know, understand and identify these problem people and solve a problem even while they're asleep. And then the last one is, uh, and I'm just picking on German they have the best sense of humor, uh, is why is Germany angry, right? And this is, I've touched on it a couple times already, but I can't underline how important it is. Um, the fact that countries will feel bad if you're not giving them the same level of service uh, is something that can actually cost you a tremendous amount of money and success in territories. You know, Germany is almost always the number two territory in the West after the U.S. financially, as far as player engagement and things like that. You know, you have to be very careful because uh, sometimes there, you know, there are cultural differences. There are just phrasing differences. Like for example, in Germany, the uh, the privacy laws are a lot different, and people treat credit cards a lot different than they do in the U.S. You know, in the U.S., like I mean, I have my credit cards in a million different stored online at Amazon and you know everywhere else. Uh, Germans don't really do that. So you know, if you don't have people who are paying attention not only to what the language is, you know, okay, we're going to put this in accurate language, but they can come back and say, hey, actually, did you consider that in Germany the law is this way or people behave this way um, or people will be upset by this, you know, then they can identify those issues to us and prevent us from making mistakes. They can also see when we've already screwed up specifically in a community, right? Uh, one example on Blade and Soul that everyone loves is swastikas because, you know, in Asian cultures, swastikas are, you know, a, a symbol of luck, a, a religious symbol. You know, you see them on a temple and no one really cares. Uh, in Germany, obviously, there's a lot of sensitivity to swastikas. Um, so we always try to make sure that we take them out of the games, you know, pull them out of the art and things like that uh, to be respectful of German culture. and you know, sometimes we'll miss one <laughs> and it'll be posted up on the German forums, uh, sometimes by a very angry person, sometimes by a person who's just pointing it out because it's funny. Uh, but, you know, to people in America, if you, if you hadn't been to Germany, if you hadn't interacted with Germans, you might not know that aspect of their culture. So having these folks that are integrated with our team, you know, really gives us the context on it too. Uh, and make sure that, because we have community managers for the languages that we cover, but, you know, that's, again, that's just one, one person for each language. You know, having multiple people, two or three sets of eyes just on the same stuff, you know, it's the same thing that you, you probably do with your teams already. Hey, check my work. Hey, what do you think of this? Uh, but having the groups, you know, for, for the individual territories really adds value. Awesome. Thank you, Omi. Those are really good examples. Um, so in summary here, um, just wanted to summarize the pain, that these pain points are, are universal and the stress on your core team of, con of like Omid's team, like he's talking about, of constantly worrying about, you know, what's going to happen while we're asleep, not to mention trying to strike some kind of work-life balance. Uh, it, you know, it's tough to keep that up over the long haul and, on-call translation services can be prohibitively expensive. Justifying the budget for that kind of service as a standalone service can, can really be tough to implement. And even so, tasking localization teams outside of the community team requires a lot of back and forth and meticulously written emails, transferring of terminology glossaries, version control, etc. And with this cross-functional mo moderator translator team in place, you get Translation consistency and relevance, like we've been talking about, your, your translators really are steeped in the culture of your community. They have the context and the quick contact with your internal team, your internal community team, to quickly work out any questions, turn around translations within minutes that otherwise take, you know, like Omid was saying, 24 hours, and that's with, like, really putting the pressure on. Uh, then also this, this reduction of operational churn a moderator translator simply has the answers to some of these necessary context questions that a translator outside of the community team would need. 
they're able to freely and, and creatively, and I think that's a really important point, like the example that we showed, they can creatively incorporate this community culture know-how into their translations without asking, having to ask for these micro-level confirmations by your internal team. And then finally, triple duty, English specialty language plus on-call translation. And with this kind of team, you have, you have a single person, single people who do the work of three separate skill sets. English, specialty language, so your German and French social and forums are covered right alongside your English. And then, of course, this added ability to perform translation work using a computer-aided translation tool. So all the while, you're building your glossaries and translation memories for themselves. So the translators are building them for themselves, the, the entire team, and really any future team members who will join in. So ramping new team members on, on the mod, best practices and translation and team culture is incredibly efficient using this system. So thank you all for your attention up to this point. I hope you've all gotten a lot out of this webinar and then at the very least some tidbits to help you. And at this time, I'd really like to open up to any questions that you might have. Um, Omid and I would love to answer anything that you've been wondering about and we're, we're going to try to get to all of them. But if for some reason we don't get to yours, please do feel free to contact me on email or via Twitter. It, with any questions, of course, with any follow-up, just feel, you can definitely contact me. And uh, first of all, I'm going to hit these questions. Let's see. Here is a question. Okay, this came up a lot earlier, so I really thank you for your patience. The question is, we definitely need coverage for some languages for translation and moderation, but mostly we just need English. And let's see. Oh, so, so how do you, sorry, I'm paraphrasing. So how do you suggest integrating this kind of model for my team. Um, so the folks we hire at LionBridge on our community bench, they're all at least bilingual. So what some of our clients do is for languages, if, if they don't necessarily need 24-7 coverage or even if they aren't sure if they need translation or moderation yet at all in that language, we can assign people whose main task is just straight moderation work in English but they also speak an additional language. So they can help to research the community to help you grow for their native language. And they can even start uh, contacting and messaging and, and developing relationships with top influencers in that language, which is, will help seed growth for that community should you choose to open official community channels in those languages later. And we've even had folks working in that capacity who help to build glossaries, which is really cool when that happens. It's uh, if you, you have like a really active community, for example, uh, in Russia, and they you don't have your game localized yet in that in that territory, but you are working on it, and there's a community already out there, and they have ideas about oh, how things should be localized. It's pretty cool because then they can become a part of what's going on and be a part of the localization itself, which then of course brings them closer to the game and. Um, yeah, and I want yeah. to jump in here too, because um, that, I mean, that question is actually really good and was something that I thought through when I was looking for moderation services, uh, because, you know, we looked at several, several companies that provide moderation and the prices were all fairly comparable and in talking to Lionbridge, it just sort of clicked to me. It's like, wait a second, so all of your moderators would be bilingual in the languages that I need. Yes. Okay, well, since that's the case and it costs, you know, about the same as the other services, then don't I, I'm basically just getting English moderators and they also happen to speak the languages I need. Because for us, you know, probably I would say 75 to 90 percent of the work ends up being in English, just depending on, you know, where the products are in their life cycle. Um, so, you know, the idea of having sp a specific French moderator or a specific Italian moderator or whatever uh, was actually pretty cost prohibitive because it feels like, okay, well, what if that community really slows down or gets quiet? That person doesn't have a lot of value that they can bring to the broader team, whereas the fact that they're bilingual means that if, for example, 
like if, for example, we just decided that we weren't going to support any languages anymore, um, we wouldn't have to go, you know, do a massive reorganization of how our moderation team works. If suddenly we decided we wanted to support 20 more languages than we do, um, you know, it would just be a matter of talking to Chloe and saying, okay, well, we need, you know, a guy who speaks Polish, we need a guy who speaks Portuguese, we need, a, you know, a guy who speaks Farsi, and those people just start appearing <laughs> over the course of the next couple <laughs> weeks. Cool, thanks. And actually, another a question came in, which was, um, you know, will you come in and provide a needs assessment? So maybe, Omid, you can speak to that, uh, how that process went for you as far as us um, working that out with you, what you needed and setting up your program. Yeah, I think, so it was really great because both Chloe and a few other people that work at Lionbridge came in, had, you know, already had a fair amount of familiarity with NCSoft and obviously with gaming in general. Um, we're able to sort of talk through, hey, here's my org chart, here's how we've been using moderators, here's the product life cycle that's coming up, um, and really sort of get a proposal. Uh, we got several proposals from Chloe that, you know, obviously was like, oh, we'll change this, do this, and they all came back, you know, within sort of 12 to 24 hours, you know, modified to the request. But, you know, I, I would think that you know, even if you even if you didn't know quite how much you needed, even sharing just some product plans, life cycles, you know, that sort of thing, that Chloe would probably be pretty solid at just putting together a proposal for you on what you would need. Good, thank you, Omid. <laughs> and then um, another question that came in. Oh, I'll kind of kind of combine these, which is, you know, how do pilots work, and and how do you know you're ready for moderation services? So. Pilots, um, I mean, that's the kind of thing where we really, like we were just talking about with Omid, you know, we sit down and, and speak with you and, and talk about what kind of goals you're trying to achieve and, um, you know, where you are, how your social looks currently. We really take a, a deep dive at with your, in, within your social channels and your forums to see, uh, you know, to how to know when you're ready for moderation services, I think, um, there are definitely crisis situations that occur where you realize, wow, we really need to have more moderation. Like if something, if your social, if your Facebook blew up and there was just a bunch of really horrible commentary, or the the whole conversation just is starting to go totally negative, or it's just Deadsville. Um, you know, there are a lot of different ways to figure out. Um, whether you're ready for moderation services, and and we definitely do run pilots. Um, you know, again, it just kind of depends on what your particular situation is, and um, but we're we're definitely open to doing that. Um, I definitely want to answer this question because I I think this one really gets to the heart of what makes this model special. And uh, this question came in uh, just now, so thank you. Um, so it is we already have bilingual moderators and they do on the fly translations when asked so I don't really see the difference with this model <laughs> so appreciate your candor um, in in that case one big difference is or it can be that the general workflow is just very organizing using slack shift reporting all that I, I'm not sure how you have it organized at your company but really the biggest distinction and where you we've exponentially increased efficiency is the use of our CAT translation workspace and employing moderators who know how to use CAT tools. So, you know, because all the translations they perform are done within this tool, so each time similar translations come up, uh, and they're often very similar, you know, up to 90% of the translations really can already be taken care of by the translation memories that exist in this tool they've built up this previous work done by other moderator translators. Then, of course, as I've spoken about this benefit, um, you know, the fact that any new team members benefit from that learning curve that's already transpired. So there's just a much shorter learning curve to get new members up to speed. So I think we've got um, time. Did you have anything to add there, Omid? No, I thought that was perfect. Okay. <laughs> Um, so we've got a couple more questions related to reporting. So how to measure success and uh, do we provide roll-up reporting so you can track country or global trends? And uh, absolutely, I mean, depending on how, what kind of structures you already have in place, what kind of tools you're already using, 
um, we definitely provide that. So we've got um, our, well, the way that we structure, usually we have a coordinator who is involved on our side in doing that kind of reporting and that person either uses a tool that you're already using, maybe you've got Sprinkler, maybe you're just using Hootsuite, um, maybe you're using a combination of Facebook Insights, Twitter Analytics, et cetera. But what we do is we work with you to benchmark where you are in social, again, talk about you know what your goals are for uh, social overall and how it integrates into your marketing, uh, perhaps even into customer service, you might be uh, we might we can also measure you know are you getting fewer ticket requests in customer service because people are being headed off of the pass uh, through community so yes we we do provide that kind of reporting the the success is measured based on our uh, suggestions combined with what's important for you usually has to do with uh, how many you know, simple things like how many followers you have, uh, you know, how many fans you have, et cetera, on social, and then deeper into engagement. So, what's your engagement rate on your your page? Uh, how that relates to conversion rates? How that's relating to retention? Um, so we can really slice and dice it any which way. But um, yes, we definitely we definitely do that for these kind of programs. So yeah, oh, go ahead. I would say too that um, you know because we had we had our own reporting structures in place for what we were looking for, um, and one of one of my favorite things about our division of publishing at NCSoft is we change our reporting strategy probably every two or three weeks. So we then very often pass that along, you know, down to the the community coordinator at Lionbridge, saying, hey, you know, uh, the production team now would like to see this kind of information as well, or can we change the format so that it looks like this? Um, everything just basically adapts to, to our requests. Um, you know, they, they budget the time really well, and we, we get a basic report that then feeds into the specific community manager reports for sentiment analysis and really just understanding what's going on in the communities. Um, so it ends up being sort of our frontline report. Awesome. Thank you, Amin. All right. Well, I, we're going to wrap up. Um, as I said, if you if any other questions come up, please do feel free to contact us. I want to say a big thank you to Omid for taking part in this today. Uh, it really was really awesome having you as a co-presenter. So I really appreciate your taking the time. Thank you very much. And you, sure. Um, all right. Well, we're going to go ahead and conclude. So. Thank you, everyone, for attending. I hope you got a lot out of this and uh, look forward to talking to you again sometime. Thanks.